forever. Nathan reported to David all the words of this entire revelation. This is the word of the Lord. Well, I took my car to get service this week and I showed my great ignorance about what is involved in, uh, sorry, I, not to get service, to get new tyres on the back because the tyres were bald. Um, I went in and that was fine, they were waiting for me. I, I waited half an hour, they changed the tyres, I paid, I left. But when I got to the car, I panicked because the new tyres weren't on the rear where the tyres needed replacing, they were on the front. Those who know about these things know where this is going. Um, I was in a hurry, I went back in, uh, I told them, I must have forgotten to tell you, it was the rear tyres that needed replacing. And the man said, they've been rotated. <laughs> and I, said, I, I, I stood there for a minute, and then it dawned on me. He said, we always put the new tyres on the front. The front tyres have gone to the back, so I left, relieved, <laughs> but feeling slightly foolish. Changing tyres is one of the many things I can't do. I need to get someone else to do it for me. Serving others and being served is part of life. That's the way things work. Uh, we all need help from others and we all give help to others in one way or another. Whether in our work, uh, whether helping friends and family, or volunteering in some capacity. But where does serving God fit in? Because God calls us to serve Him. But why? It's not in the same way that we serve other people who need our help. Maybe the way we serve God is more like, uh, you know, when someone in a period drama uh, is speaking to a, to, to a lord or lady or king or queen and, and, and says, I am your humble servant. They're in the power of this person, but they're saying, I'm here to serve you. And the fact that uh, Adele's already uh, mentioned that uh, the passage we're looking at is, is uh, widely considered to be in the form of a covenant. God's making a covenant with David. And there are models of covenants from the ancient Near East. Uh, and they would often be put in place between uh, states. So there, there was kind of the... the, the the powerful state and the, the, little, the little kingdom, little state. This one was the, the, the suzerain and this one was the vassal. And uh, it, it wasn't a, an equal relationship. This one was saying, I'll protect you, but you need to serve me. Um, is that the way we serve God? Well, not really, because kings, queens, uh, the rulers of vassal states and, uh, and suzerain states... Prime Ministers and Presidents, they are human. And they actually need people to serve them or they couldn't get anything done. Yes, they're in a position of power, but they're also dependent on people. But God's not dependent on us. Our passage to Samuel 7, it's a very significant point in salvation history. The covenant that God makes with David it's actually kind of initiated by David, though he doesn't know it. Um, last week we saw that David had become king of all Israel. He'd set up his capital in Jerusalem. And since then he's built a palace and things are settled. And he calls Nathan, a prophet, uh, to come and chat with. Uh, and Nathan's actually going to come up uh, a bit. He had a bit to do with David. We'll be hearing about uh, from him over the next few weeks. And David shares his mind with Nathan. Here I am, living in a house of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. The ark of God, it was the closest thing to, to being a place where God was. It was an ornate box, uh, and it had uh, some miraculous artifacts from Israel's history in it. It was designed like a throne for God, with uh, carved worshipping angels covering it. And during Israel's wandering in the wilderness on their journey to the promised land, this ark had been carried around and then when Israel set up 
camp, uh, the, the ark would be put in a tent, a special tent called the tabernacle. But David thinks this isn't how it should be anymore. Things have gone well for David. He's built up his military skills. Uh, and after years of political instability, he now has the support of all the people. He has a mandate, he has power, and he's in a position to do something for God, something significant. After all, God's people were not just a nomadic people anymore, they'd be here permanently. And the way to show that was to have a temple for the God of the Israelites. Don't we resonate with David? David cares about God's honour. He wants to worship and value God. He wants to use his resources to do God a service. It's good to serve God. We're called to serve God. And this doesn't just mean serving at church. We're called to serve God in all our lives. For example, in our jobs. No matter our job, we can serve God and we can glorify God actively. Some examples, it might be in what we do, working hard at our, uh, at our skills to develop our God-given abilities, to grow in expertise, to achieve what few people can. Or it might be how we go about our work. We might be able to contribute to colleagues and staff and, and make the team cohesive, bringing out their best. That's glorifying God because it's part of God's design for us to, to work in community. Or it might be why you do what you do. Maybe you're committed to it because it makes a difference in the world. Maybe you're restoring brokenness and, and overcoming challenges and contributing to the order and goodness God created the world for. Or one more, maybe it's, it's what you can do with the results of your work. So maybe you have significant influence to change uh, things, uh, maybe you have significant earning potential, and you strategically put that to use for kingdom purposes. We're called to serve God. But we're also called to know God and to know why we're called to serve Him. That night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I haven't dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I've been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I've moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God doesn't say, thank you, David, you would do a faithful service by building this house for me. God says, if I needed a house, don't you think I could have done something about that already? Don't you realise, David, I've been moving about from place to place in a tent by choice, for a reason. Just as Jesus would one day say, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Not because it wasn't in his power to get a house. Rather, it was his mission to humble himself and to seek and save the lost. There are two lessons for us here. The first is to remember that while God calls us to serve him, he doesn't actually need us to serve him. He could do perfectly well without us. And we'll talk about why he calls us to serve shortly. Second, we mustn't assume that our resources and our expertise always match God's ways. Sometimes they might overlap. But Jesus didn't need a permanent home. God didn't need a temple. I think in particular, when we have the chance to do something great... We need to remind ourselves that God's kingdom comes through humble means. If God has said his work will be achieved through ordinary people and ordinary relationships, 
Well, we shouldn't depend on professional-looking production, for example. Or if God has said the gospel is the power to save those who believe, well, then we shouldn't expect they'll be saved through being impressed with our programs or, or size or political action or something. So if it's the case that God can achieve his purposes perfectly well without us, why does he call us to serve him? The answer is in the message that God gives Nathan for David. And I, I want to point out three things in this message. First, briefly, the means we have to serve God were given to us by God. Verse 8, Now then, tell my servant David, this is what the Lord Almighty says, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you've gone. I have cut off all your enemies from before you. In other words, David, this position you're now in and able to serve me from, and even build a temple, you didn't get there yourself. I held your hand the whole way. Anything you give is only because I've first given it to you. The means we have to serve God is given to us by God. Second, the way to value God is not by giving to God, but by receiving from God. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth. And I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that you can have a home of your own and no longer be disturbed. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. David thinks he can build God a house, but in fact, God will build him a house. And that's the pattern through Scripture. Abraham valued God not by trying to get an heir for himself, but by receiving and believing God's promise. The Israelites valued God not by showing they could overthrow the Egyptians, but by receiving God's salvation. Jesus taught that the way to value God was to be unashamedly needy, the tax collector beating his breast, the children being the greatest in heaven, the neediest of all. For he came not to call the righteous, but sinners, who had nothing to give, but everything to receive. How do you know if you're basing your relationship on God, uh, with God on, on serving him or on receiving from him? Well, you can tell in your church life. If you think it's all about serving God, then you'll need to be needed. But if you know that fundamentally it's about receiving from God, that then you'll love being part of God's people, even if you don't have a role to play. You'll value just being at church, whether or not you're rostered on. You can tell in your life in the world as well. If you think your relationship with God depends on serving him, You'll never be satisfied unless you've made something of yourself. Otherwise, you'll think you've failed. You haven't proved yourself before God. But if you know that you please God, in fact, by receiving from him, well, then all human praise and reputation and acceptance and success, it, it pales into insignificance. Because your praise and reputation are from God. You have God's acceptance. Your success is bound up in Christ's victory. The way to value God isn't by giving to God, it's by receiving from God. Well, how do you make sure you're doing that? How do you make sure you're basing your relationship with God on receiving from him? You do what Nathan did for David. You focus on what God has done for you and what God has promised to do for you. Which leads to the third point. We can give God a drop, but God has given us an ocean. God doesn't promise David success only in his own lifetime, but also in the next generation to establish his son's kingdom. That's, he's talking about his son Saul, who will, uh, Solomon rather, who will become king. 
And God says, by the way, he will build me a house. I think this is a concession, um, a bit like how he let Israel have a king, even though they didn't need one. He let Solomon build a temple. But he didn't promise this only about David's son, but also his entire line. Your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God gives David nothing less than an eternal dynasty. Something that seems impossible, and it would have been impossible, except for God's extraordinary way of fulfilling that promise through Jesus, God's son, uh, David's son and God's son. And like David, God has given us more than we can grasp. We too are under the covenant. And did you notice, when we were reading through the passage, this covenant, unlike some other covenants in the Bible, it's unconditional. God gives promises and he says he'll never walk away from it. We are under God's unconditional covenant. He'll never walk away from us. What is this covenant? Well, it's as if the prophet Nathan is addressing us. Only we have Jesus fulfilling this covenant. So, here's what Nathan might say to you. Now then, tell my servant. Put your own name in here. Tell my servant. This is what God says. I took you from your former way of life, separated from Christ, without hope and without God in the world. I left the 99 and came to seek you. And when I found you, I rejoiced. I've been with you wherever you have gone. I've cut off all your enemies from before you, sin, death, and the evil one. I triumphed over them by the cross. Now I will make your name great. You are the light of the world, a town on a hill that cannot be hidden. And I've established you in love that you may have power to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. The Lord himself has established a house for you, being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You are born of God. When you do wrong, I will discipline you, for I am treating you as children. But my love will never be taken away from you. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. You shall endure in the Father's house forever before me. And when Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. God has given us an ocean. And to value God fundamentally is about having an attitude of receiving what he gives. And only then are we ready to serve him. Because he does have work for us to do, just like he had work for David to do, ruling his people faithfully. But the reason he calls us to serve him is because that in itself is a gift from God. It's a gift because when you consider that list of things that God's given us and done for us, serving is part of who he has made us to be. When I ask my kids to do some housework, especially uh, if it's on the edge of their abilities, it's not because uh, I need them to do it. Usually I could do it faster and with less arguments myself. I ask them because that's part of them growing into who they're meant to be. When I got my first programming job, it was a real gift. I was new inexperienced, they probably could have got the work done faster and more easily without me. But they were investing in me. And serving there was a gift because I was the one who was growing. That's why we serve God. He's teaching us, growing us, training us to be more and more like Jesus. And it never stops until the one who began a good work in us carries it to completion on the day of Christ Jesus. God doesn't need us, for he has given us everything we could ever have to give to him. 
but in his grace, he gives us not only an inheritance that will never perish or spoil or fade, but a place in his people now, including the call to serve, to grow in Christ-likeness, and to follow him. Let's pray. God, you are the great giver. Everything we have comes from you. And we know that when we were powerless, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, please show us if we're basing our relationship with you on serving you. And help us to receive from you and to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. And from that, take and use our service, offered like children helping their parents for your glory. Amen. Please stand and join us in song.